All right. Thank you all for joining us um, here today. Um, oops, sorry. So thank you all for joining us uh, for this IPR webinar um, on how you can employ effective communication strategies to elevate your mental health and combat burnout. Uh, my name is Brittany Higginbotham, and I am the Communications Associate for the Institute for Public Relations. Um, again, before we begin, we uh, encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A box, and we'll allot time at the very end to answer a few questions. You are welcome to use the chat box at any time to leave comments, share resources. Um, please note that an IPR staff member will be moderating the questions through the Q&A only. Um, if you have any logistical or technical technical difficulties, just message an IPR staff member and we will help you. Um, and then this webinar will be recorded and available for playback on our website and YouTube channel. We will also link any resource, resources shared today. All right, now let's get to it. I'd like to introduce our panelists before we dive in. Our first speaker is Dr. Laura Lemon. She's an assistant professor and scholar at the University of Alabama's Department of Advertising and Public Relations. She primarily researches internal communication and employee engagement with a specialization in qualitative methods. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Patrick Fallon, an assistant professor in the School of Journalism and Media Studies at San Diego State University. He is also the chief research editor at the Institute for Public Relations um, Organizational Communication Research Center. Now, our third speaker, Emily uh, Graham, is ha was having, unfortunately, some weather issues in Texas, and she will not be able to join us, um, but that's okay, and we, you know, we hope nothing but the best for Emily um, and safety in her travels. So, to kick off, um, we're going, I'm going to be introducing a few different questions that Laura and Patrick are going to um, answer and kind of just in a very conversational and formal way. Um, either of you, Laura, Patrick, feel free to jump in um, and, you know, you don't have to answer every question, just wherever you feel, um, you know, you have the best, um, best answer. So my first question will be, in each of your roles, how do you define burnout and how does it show up in what you do? Well, I'll go ahead and jump in here. Thank you, Brittany, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the webinar today, really grateful for the opportunity um, to discuss my research and things that I'm passionate about and um, something that's meaningful for all of us. I think we're all here because we're either burned out or know people who are burned out and they're either on our team or our um, partners or colleagues. And so hopefully you walk away today with some resources, some tips and tools that can help you navigate um, the coming months, coming year. And then the next thing that, that we encounter um, in our in our world, so burnout um, is a is a concept that initially came from the human resources literature, and which is important to note because I'm going to transition later on today and talk about what public relations can do in terms of extending how we understand burnout and employee engagement, which is really awesome opportunity for both scholars and practitioners to reconceptualize the way in which we understand burnout. And so human resources. Um, literature and scholars uh, initially conceptualized it as the opposite of engagement. And so they utilized a model using the job demands versus resources. And so this model demonstrates that the two processes that lead to job burnout would include high demands of a job and a lack of job resources. And so in this way, high levels of burnout are frequently found when the demands of the job are high and the available resources are low. As I mentioned, it's the opposite of engagement. So I think it's important too to talk about what do we mean by employee engagement? Um, and this is oftentimes defined as the harnessing of the organizational members selves to their work. And so what we see here is that we better understand how employees employ themselves um, in their roles, both physically, cognitively, as well as emotionally. And the research has shown that there are certain factors that would lead into how engaged an employee would be in their particular role. So that would be things such as meaningfulness, like a meaningfulness of the job, safety, so psychological safety, how safe someone feels to express themselves in their role um, without the opportunities or chances of ne negative repercussions. And then last, which would be availability. So um, you know, the availability of resources. 
And so this ties really nicely into how uh, burnout shows up in my world, right? So I'm an academic um, in higher education. Brittany mentioned I worked at the University of Alabama. And I think we um, as academics lived for, through a very precarious time over the last two years, um, because if you talk about psychological safety, well, oftentimes a lot of our institutions couldn't even guarantee physical safety. So in, in getting to that engaged employee and, and then therefore burnout, we, there was this interesting um, sort of connection between all of that because employees um, of higher ed institutions were feeling, you know, at risk having to go into the workplace. Um, and so, you know, couldn't even get to the fact of like, how, how psychological safe do I feel to share myself in the workplace? Um, so we're, we, I work, you know, in a field where we don't have unlimited resources to be able to dedicate to ensure um, that those the employees have the things that they need. And that even stems into the student life too. So I, I think over the last two years, we've seen um, you know, students burned out, faculty burned out, and a lot of that stems from the lack of resources that were available. Um, anecdotally, I'll just sh share, you know, here at the University of Alabama, we don't even have enough resources um, for mental health. Uh, for students. So if they want to go get an appointment at the health center, it takes oftentimes two to three weeks to get in, which is just not ideal. So um, we're in a, an, unfortunately, not a great time in terms of, of navigating this new space. And hopefully over the coming year, I think we're going to see some positive changes. Um, but how it manifested for us as academics, I think, um, you know, we were flying by the seat of our pants and, and oftentimes feeling really overwhelmed um, because the demands of the job were high and the resources were low. Yeah, I um, completely agree with, with what Laura has been, has been saying. I don't know what, what I can add to that, but I think, um, you know, one of, I think what's really important to understand regarding burnout is that it isn't something that just happens overnight. Right. Um, so, you know, just because my last three days of work have been stressful doesn't necessarily mean I'm burnt out. Right. Um, burnout um, is, is, you know, typically defined as a syndrome, um, you know, that occurs because of prolonged uh, chronic job stress that hasn't been managed. Right. Um, so um, burnout, um, you know, the, the, the way I like to understand it is is you know, just a result of poor workplace practices, poor workplace policies, um, and just kind of a systemic societal um, problems that occur um, and that have been left unchanged. Um, Christina Maslach, uh, she's uh, you know, a social psychologist who's, who's one of the pioneers of, of research on job burnout. And she has suggested that burnout has three different dimensions. Um, the, the first one, is exhaustion, right? Um, you know, exhaustion refers to individual stress. So it's that feeling you have of, you know, just not being able to, 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 to take it anymore. Um, uh, you know, I, I want to go home, but there's more to do, right? So that's one component of burnout, right? This exhaustion. And second component is cynicism. Um, and cynicism uh, to me is at the heart of burnout. Um, it's you saying, you know, take this job, and shove it, right? Um, and, and you know, when you're feeling this way, um, you know, you begin to feel negative and hostile and cynical. And as a result, you know, your your performance just takes a hit. Um, and then that third component of, of burnout is um, professional inefficacy. Um, and and when you're feeling this way, you're you know, you're self evaluating, self evaluating yourself negatively, um, and you also begin to doubt yourself. Uh, so it's it's you saying things like. Um, you know, maybe I'm just not good at this, or maybe I shouldn't be here, or maybe I don't belong, or I'm stuck, right? And a lot of times people will describe this feeling as an erosion of their soul. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, um, in terms of my experience working at, at a university, um, you know, we're seeing very high levels of, of stress among academics and, and students, just like Laura was saying, um, you know, from, from the student perspective, um, you know, you just Google and you'll just find a hundreds of studies showing, you know, that, you know, their levels of stress, anxiety, depression, and just, you know, overall unhealthy, unhealthy coping mechanisms have increased, right, um, during the pandemic. Um, students are dealing with a lot 
Um, and as a result, uh, we're seeing a huge impact on their mental health. Um, the same is true with faculty. Uh, you know, uh, and, um, you know, burnout has been around for a very long time, right? Um, but, um, you know, all of these studies now are kind of comparing burnout pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic. And what they're showing is, um, you know, there's a substantial change in, in just kind of in a university feel setting on how faculty members are feeling. Um, you know, pre-pandemic, 30% of them said they were stressed. Post-pandemic, 70% of them said they were stressed. Pre-pandemic, 10% of them said they were angry. Post-pandemic, 35% of them said they were angry. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, all of these feelings of stress and anger impact people's behaviors. Um, and, you know, the surveys have also found that, um, you know, faculty members, about half of them during the pandemic said that they were seriously considering changing their career um, or retiring early. Right now, as communicators, we all know uh, there's a huge gap between what people say and what they do. Um, but regardless, 50% is an extremely high number. Uh, so to sum it up, you know, burnout is a major issue uh, today uh, within universities. Thank you. Um, and we, you sort of touched on this as far as pre-pandemic and po post-pandemic or you know, during pandemic, but could you uh, um, elaborate also on just how burnout has evolved um, over the past few years and um, what are the signs and causes um, in comparison? Has Have the signs and causes of burnout, um, of course, the obvious with the pandemic, but has, how has that all played, um, played in together um, in light of the causes of burnout? Well, I'll just speak a little bit on how some of the research has changed in terms of the way public relations scholars look at this um, phenomenon, because I think it's really important to um, to assess how we've we've as and when I say we, I mean public relations scholars have moved um, the field forward, right? So, from a human resources perspective, employees are assets that need to be managed, right? We're numbers on a balance sheet. Um, and I think when public relations jumps in, um, we can apply, and some scholars have called for this, um, applying what we call the co-creational approach. And so this, this transitions the way in which we see employees. And so I think um, given the state of the world, this is a shift that's going to need to, it's starting to happen, it's gonna to continue to, to, it's going to need to continue to happen. And so when we see this co-creational approach, we start to see all organizational members as having intrinsic value and they become partners in the meaning making process. And so it's no longer about management's initiatives or what management's perspective is um, and then hoping that employees carry it out. So much of the employee engagement scholarship in the beginning was surveys or interviews with management asking their perceptions about how their employees were experiencing burnout or engagement, but no one ever went and talked to employees, which is just ironic, right? And so now we're starting to spend some time really capturing that employee, that employee experience, which is really where my research centers around. Um, and I'm, I'm just a big proponent of the public relations field being offering, being able to offer this new meaning making lens because when you do that, stakeholders become valuable and bound together across all, you know, across the entire organization. And then we start to be more prepared to handle crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic, right? If, you know, if a pandemic or a crisis is going to exacerbate, you know, given the numbers that Patrick just shared is going to exacerbate how burnout is manifesting for employees, that we need to address it and, and hopefully deal with it on the front end. Um, and this will help organizations become more fluid, more nimble and be able to adapt to change that they probably wouldn't have been able to do so um, without sort of acknowledging what's, what's been going on. So um, for me, you know, in the research that I do is finding ways for this co-creational approach to be, to be applied, especially for organizations navigating a crisis um, because we know that disengaged employees are more likely to speak negative about their employer to external audiences. And this is going to be incredibly detrimental for an organization navigating a crisis. 
Um, and so, you know, let's let's deal with this this on the front end. And so, you know, some of my research even advocates for a burnout assessment um, during the pre-crisis planning phase um, because that I think it can't be an afterthought. And unfortunately, I think for some industries and organizations, it becomes an afterthought when it's become too big of a deal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just kind of to, to add to that, um, uh, you, you know, I, I, and going back a little bit to what I was saying previously, um, you know, I think that one of the things um, that a lot of people and organizations, um, you know, uh, what they need to start becoming aware of is that, um, you know, burnout doesn't just mean employees feel stressed. Um, it, it, it has a huge impact on their health um, mm -hmm. and can unfortunately sometimes even lead to their death. Um, and it's not me that's saying this. I mean, you know, the World Health Organization, um, they have conducted studies just showing how long work hours led to, um, you know, about 750,000 deaths from stroke and ischemic heart disease in 2016, uh, which was almost a 30% increase since the year 2000, right? Um, other studies um, have found that people working 55 hours or more per week were 33% more likely to suffer a stroke compared to those working, you know, 35, 40 hours. Um, so people are literally working themselves to death. Um, and while, you know, the notion of burnout uh, leading to death is a relatively, um, you know, novel concept in Western countries, um, it is important uh, to realize that the concept of, you know, dying for a paycheck is so common in countries like, you know, Japan and China, uh, that they have a name for it. Um, it's called, you know, Hiroshi in Japan and Wo Laosi in China. Um, you know, I, I remember back in, in the 90s uh, when we first started hearing these stories about, um, you know, middle-aged businessmen in, in Japan working so many hours that they would just drop dead, um, uh, you know, from a bodily failure um, or, or just opt to end their lives at, you know, committing uh, suicide in a subway station rather than return to the office. Um, and... And I, I, I remember having these conversations with, you know, people in the 90s and early 2000s where we were all commenting on, you know, how surreal that was. Um, and we saw this as a, you know, curiosity, as a kind of weird regional phenomenon that was only occurring in Asia. Uh, but today we get it. Um, when we hear about, uh, you know, China's 996 work culture, uh, right? Working from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week, we still see it as you know, kind of brutal, but it also kind of feels that this is the type of culture taking place right here, right now. Um, and you know, people are working longer hours, uh, and we're starting to realize that it's a risk um, uh, that you know you, you might die because of engaging in this behavior. Um, and, and, and you know, when we're seeing this happen in alarmingly high rates in the U.S. Um, you know, again, taking this back to studies, um, you know, uh, studies have found that, you know, the workplace environment in the U.S. could be responsible for um, 120,000 excess deaths per year, right, which, you know, if, if, if you follow that number would mean that workplace is kind of the fifth leading cause of death. Um, so, you know, uh, um, going back to your question about, you know, how is burnout evolved? Um, I'd say that more people are feeling, uh, are feeling this way um, and that they're also starting to become aware of, um, you know, the harmful impact that it has on their lives. Thank you. Um, when we discuss ways to, now what can we do about it? Um, let's first talk about what organizations can do to support employees suffering from burnout. And, and then in that hand, how can they, how can organizations prevent burnout in their employees? I can jump oh, in here. I'd love yeah. to hear Patrick's feedback because he's the yeah. internal comms um, expert because I think communication plays a huge role in that. But I, I do think that uh, culture is the first place to start. So um, an organizational culture that is facilitating burnout, just, you know, some, you know, with some of the examples that Patrick was just sh sharing is the number one route. And so this has to start with management, right? So if you are going to say, hey, we offer these great benefits and um, 
you know, but there's going to be a unspoken repercussion if you take your vacation time or you're going to be made to feel guilty because you take your vacation time. Well, then employees are never going to take their vacation time. So it has to be an organization that really is about drawing some boundaries. And I think some organizations do this really well. Um, you know, even something is, um, you know, like I have a friend right now, she works at Salesforce and she just went on six months of paid maternity leave. That's incredible. Now, not every organization has the resources to be able to, you know, provide that to somebody, but, um, you know, something as small as not emailing people in the middle of the night or on the weekends, because that's going to instill the need for that particular employee to respond. So I think having management lead by example in terms of um, making sure that employees cultivate this sort of, um, you know, not balance or just seeking the opportunity to, to decompress, right? And, and to find ways to check in with themselves so that they know that they're experiencing burnout. I think oftentimes too, um, you know, as Patrick mentioned, it is something that happens over time and I don't even think we know that we're experiencing it. And so one of the other things I think that an organization could do is to offer check-in surveys over time. So maybe every quarter, five questions, um, offering questions that maybe you hadn't even thought about um, to help people sort of assess their own burnout. Um, a friend of mine just expressed her, her experience with burnout over the last year. She had some uh, deaths in the family, had to navigate that, plus a really, um, you know, strenuous job that was having her work 80 hours a week. And it wasn't until she went on vacation over winter holiday, did she say, wow, I'm really burnt out. It required her to back away from the work, to take a pause, to take a break. Um, and then she started to make some changes in her life. And so I think that organizations could really, um, you know, be a proponent of that and making sure that their organizational cultures, um, champions, um, rest, play, the, the ability to find le the leisure time. But one thing I want to say about this when it comes to what organizations role is in, um, you know, in, in helping employees navigate burnout or eliminating burnout, it cannot be done to make employees more productive. So sometimes we think this sounds like a really great initiative because then we're going to have more productive employees. Well, you're going to end up in the same place that you started and it has to be bigger than that. So I believe the organizations should really be striving to develop these programs to ensure that all employees have valuable work experiences because it's the ethical thing to do um, so that people aren't risking their health or even their lives um, for their job. So we, it does come down to being an ethical initiative for organizations and making sure that their policies and their procedures um, reflect that as well. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Laura. I mean, ethics is, is critical. Um, and I also agree with, with the factor that it kind of you know, starts with management. Um, you know, if organizations really want to prevent burnout, um, you know, the first thing they need to realize is uh, and recognize is that the root causes of burnout uh, do not really lie with the individual, they lie with the organization. Um, you know, some, some time ago, I, I was watching uh, a video on YouTube um, in which Christina Maslach, uh, you know, the, the, the burnout research pioneer I was talking about previously, um, was talking about burnout. And in that video, um, you know, she was asking the audience to picture uh, canaries uh, in a coal mine. Um, and before entering the coal mine, uh, you know, they were healthy birds and, you know, that were, you know, just singing away. Um, however, after being exposed, um, you know, to, 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 to all of that situation, you know, the, the, the carbon monoxide uh, during their time in the coal mines, they left the coal mine sick, right? And they were no longer singing. Um, none of us would assume that, uh, you know, the canaries got sick because they didn't take enough, you know, mindfulness courses, right? Or, or didn't download the latest meditation app. Um, you know, the same is true with people. Uh, we need to stop thinking that we can prevent employees uh, from burning out by offering more yoga classes, right? Or teaching them how to develop grit. Um, you know, it, don't get me wrong. Uh, these are great tools for improving well-being, um, but they are not the cure to burnout. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful that some organizations um, are offering these perks, 
Um, but if they truly want to solve the problem, um, you know, their efforts need to go beyond that. Um, so, um, you know, many organizations, um, you know, uh, try to help their employees by, uh, you know, offering them mechanisms uh, to help them, you know, increase their resilience and strength. Um, and the problem with this approach um, is that it shows that organizations are simply trying to fit people to the job, right? And they're ignoring, um, you know, the, the systemic and institutional factors that are the real causes of burnout. Um, you know, uh, to fix burnout, um, we need to understand that burnout is about the organization, not the people, um, right? Um, so, um, you know, all of these yoga classes, wellness technologies, meditation apps, vacation times, that they're good, and they can definitely help people feel healthier. Um, but suggesting that they are the cure to burnout um, is problematic and even dangerous. Um, so, um, you know, instead of fitting people to the job and simply asking them to engage in self-care, um, organizations um, kind of need to, to, you know, focus on the causes of burnout. Um, so, um, you know, uh, taking us back, uh, do, do I have time, Brittany, or should I, or should I stop speaking right now? Because I can no. keep on going forever about this. <laughs> No, feel free. I want to hear All right. Um, so, so taking us kind of back to you know Maslach's definition of burnout, um, you know, uh, and the tool she uses to measure burnout. Um, you know, it, it's important to understand that someone who's dealing with burnout um, has negative scores on exhaustion, negative scores on cynicism, and negative scores on professional efficacy. Right. You need to be scoring highly on all of these uh, three dimensions. Right. If we follow Maslach's, Maslach's understanding of uh, burnout. Right. Um, so people who are only scoring high on exhaustion, um, they're not described as being burned out. They're described as being overextended. Um, right. Um, or people who are only scoring, um, you know, highly high negative scores on professional efficacy. They're categorized as, you know, feeling ineffective. Right, um, those who are only scoring high on cynicism, they're described as being disengaged. Um, so, you know, uh, according to again Maslach, um, you're only you're only feeling burnout, true burnout, um, if you're scoring high on all of these three dimensions. Um, mm -hmm. And this is really important for organizations to understand because it underscores that there's no one size fits all solution. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, people who are overextended, they have one key problem. And that's workload, right? Um, they're dealing with, you know, high demands and low resources, um, uh, or um, you know, people who are disengaged, right, or ineffective. They're dealing with other problems, right? Maybe they're dealing with problems of fairness in the workplace, um, or maybe they're dealing with problems of, you know, not receiving enough, you know, social rewards or recognition for the work they do. Um, so it's really important to understand um, that. Um, there's no one size fits all solution. And there's even no kind of one size fits all kind of for an organization. Every unit within an organization is dealing with different realities. Um, so it's, it's, it's really important to kind of um, not come up with this broad plan for everyone uh, because everyone in an organization doesn't deal with the same problems. Um, so I think kind of it's important to start with, with that understanding and that distinction. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. <laughs> so I'm curious then with, with those three components, how does one or how does an organization help an employee recognize that they are having those three experiences simultaneously and therefore are burnout? Yeah, so um, kind of this, this um, Maslach inventory uh, mm -hmm. that was created kind of in the, in the 80s and it has evolved over the decades. Um, you know, she, she just kind of has this questionnaire where, you know, all these different questions are being answered um, by employees um, and um, organizations can kind of collect this data and understand how each employee is dealing with things differently um, and therefore kind of jump in and kind of, you know, um, you know, try to find some solutions to the problems. But um, it's not just like, you know, handing out a survey and seeing how people are feeling. I mean, it, that's one thing, right? And then you'll find, okay, this is how people are actually feeling. But, um, you know, to truly, to truly solve the problem, um, you need to kind of go back to the beginning, which is, you know, what are the causes of burnout? 
Um, and kind of the, the causes are, you know, one of them is, is, you know, the one we always think about, which is workload, right? That's, that's the first one that usually comes to mind. And, you know, it's obviously an important one, um, right? Um, you know, uh, study after stat study shows that, um, you know, um, people are citing excessive workload workloads and tight deadlines as their biggest concerns. Um, and, um, you know, things have just gotten worse since the pandemic. I mean, the number of hours people have, were working after, you know, working from home increased substantially um, to what they were doing before the pandemic. Um, and, um, you know, that's, so that's one cause, right? Um, another cause can be just kind of lack of control. Um, you know, one of the reasons, top reasons people leave jobs um, is because uh, they lack a sense of autonomy um, or sometimes they're just feeling micromanaged. Um, right. Um, and, you know, I, I, I remember coming across this study uh, um, that was surveying people in Sweden um, and um, they found that, you know, people who had, um, you know, higher levels of influence uh, and task control had lower levels of, you know, illness symptoms, were absent less frequently um, and experienced less depression. Um, so giving people the tools to feel that they have the power to make decisions and to influence others within the organization that's important. Um, third cause of burnout is lack of rewards or recognitions, um, right? Um, you know, the, the, the phrase, um, uh, what is it? I'm, I'm, I'm overworked and, and underpaid, right? It's, 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 it's just way too common um, and people often joke about it. Um, the problem is that it's a major cause of burnout. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, to be fair with organizations, uh, you know, a lot of them do pay a lot of attention to paying people appropriately. Um, however, um, we also have to understand that money isn't everything. Um, organizations often forget about, you know, just the impact of social rewards, like recognition and feedback. Um, you know, when, when people work hard, they want to be acknowledged. Um, and, and, you know, we need to understand that. And, you know, um, we're, we're talking about communication, then, okay, let's find ways to acknowledge people, to reward people in a way that they find meaningful, not that we think they might find meaningful. Um, Poor relationships is another key cause of burnout. And that's something we as communicators play a really, really big role, right? Mm -hmm. um, just kind of improving relationships within the organization, building a sense of community um, among employees is just so important uh, because it drives belonging. Um, and belonging is, you know, one of the most important human capital issues. Um, and, you know, we're, we're around the world, not just in the US, you know, we're living in very polarizing times um, and our respect for each other's differences is eroding. Um, so, you know, we have, you know, hundreds of tools out there to keep us connected, um, but at the same time, it just seems like we're growing further apart. Um, so, you know, poor relationships is a major threat to healthy cultures um, and the overall business goals of, 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 of organizations. Um, mm -hmm. And then the kind of the fifth cause is uh, lack of fairness. Um, that's super, super, super important. Um, uh, when people feel that there's no organizational justice, um, you know, the, they, they'll get angry, they'll get upset. Um, and they pr they'll probably kind of, you know, uh, leave the workplace. And if they don't leave, maybe they'll take um, a higher number of sick days, right? Um, because they just don't wanna come back. Um, and then, then finally, I just add, um, it's also really important to think about values, right? Is there a kind of, a, if there's a values mismatch between, you know, me and my organization, that's going to be a problem that, that can also lead to, to burnout. Um, Laura, I think that was a really long answer to you. No, it was great. I was just, yeah. And I can't help but think, you know, just in the amount of exhaustion that people felt over the last two years, just exacerbated everything that you, that you talked about. Um, because our, are, there was a blurred line between work and home and even our home life, you know, that is often, you know, that's a job too, right? But there isn't um, a reward for that. There's no additional financial um, uh, bonuses, you know, for doing the dishes or putting the kids to bed or, um, you know, getting on a Zoom call, teaching a Zoom class and then taking care of your own, own children. Um, so it's a lot of this, you could see how it manifested exponentially over the last two years um, because what you would experience in burnout in the workplace could very easily um, happen at home mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. Um, 
so I and I so I think that's you know where we are today. And I think somebody asked in the chat. I think we're already to the point of people feeling burnt out. So what do what do we do? Yeah, I I, I agree. Um, you know this whole idea of um, uh, you know burnout. Um, you know has just the conversation of it has you know exploded. Uh, post pandemic, because now we're just not only dealing with our realities of the workplace, it's also, um, you know, just dealing with the reality of the world. Um, and that just becomes, you know, a huge burden and people, you know, everyone deals with different things in life, right. Um, but then if you add, um, you know, now I have to take care of, of, you know, some family member who's dealing with something. And now I have to, I can't see my friends because we can't go out and talk to the world. You know, you're just adding a bunch of different layers. Uh, to a situation that was already critical before. Um, and now it just kind of compounded and, and, and people are, you know, feeling like they, like, please help me uh, address this problem. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Um, and then before we get into our Q&A, um, I just wanted to see if you had any suggestions on actions that individuals can take to help themselves, um, you know, help themselves when they feel burnt out you know, maybe before they decide to quit their job or however they may otherwise respond? Um, I think it's really important that organizations, or that organizations, that individuals, despite the resources that the um, organization may or may not have, but find some ways to draw uh, boundaries. And I think that that's going to tap into making sure that you're not demanded, you know, have uh, higher demands for your job. Um, but also, as I mentioned earlier, just being able to recognize that you are feeling burnt out or you are feeling exhausted. Um, sometimes we are operating on autopilot that we don't even know what's happening. Um, and so I, I just know that somebody dropped it in the chat, but my most recent blog for OCRC was about mindfulness. And I think that that's a really important tool for all of us to use as a way to cultivate what's going on in our current experience. And so it's not, um, you know, a tool to assess whether something is negative or positive, but just a way to tune into that present moment. Um, and so for me, you know, I've utilized this in my own research. Um, I use it when I'm, you know, for teaching and then also feeling incredibly uh, stressed out because it gives me the, the ability to pause and to see, okay, um, get my mind, get my mind in order. Um, but mindfulness is defined as being aware of the present moment and exercising, um, you know, a non-judgment of that present moment. And it allows us to have sort of this openness, this curiosity of what's going on and not sort of judging what's happening, but just accepting for what it is. And maybe being able to then identify places that could potentially be, um, you know, let, places in your life that could be potentially um, dealt with. And so we can do that through practices like breath work or meditation um, or yoga. But again, you know, it's not a one size fits all approach, but this could be a tool for somebody to find a way to hit pause. As I mentioned, you know, my friend that she didn't even know she was experiencing burnout till she was able to step away. And I think meditation gives us the ability to do that for five or 10 minutes. Um, but the key component is, is to follow that up with a journaling activity. So you can start to see maybe how you have habitualized thought processes that are maybe impacting your current um, experience and how you could adjust those over time. And so this may then have you say, okay, I've, I've recognized that I'm feeling burnout and now I need to go to my supervisor and say, I need to draw some boundaries, or I need to take that vacation. I've said that I've was going to take over the last year. And so there is, if, you know, a part of this has to be agency from the employee going and hopefully having that relationship um, with somebody in their organization that they can go to and seek for help um, or going to their organization's resources to saying, you know, I don't think my, I'm dealing with this current state very well and, and utilizing those resources. But I do understand that all of that comes from, um, having that psychological safety. So tying back to what we were talking about in the beginning, that if your organization hasn't provided you that or your leadership hasn't provided you that, um, you know, back to what Patrick said about a values, um, you know, congruency, then it's, it's gonna potentially 
um, impact your ability to feel open. And that should be a message, right? If you, if you can't go to your supervisor and say, hey, I need some help. Um, I, you know, I'm feeling burnt out and need more resources or I need more recognition. Um, then maybe it's time to reflect on, on the place in which you work um, because there, there obviously is not sort of this, um, this value alignment between you and, and the people in which you work with. And um, I will tie that back to like, um, you know, if, if organizations are, one thing I want to mention too is you know, if they're out there doing, you know, surveys, assessing where, fac well, where, where their employees are, and for me, it's faculty and staff, um, and they're gathering data, but then to actually do something with that data. I think a lot of times organizations say, okay, we want to help these individuals. We're going to assess where they are, how engaged do they feel, how disengaged, are they feeling burnt out, and we gather the data, but then we don't ever hear anything um, after that. And so, um, you know, making sure that organizations are you know, sort of, again, leading from the front and saying, this is um, the information that we gathered and here are the changes that we're going to make. And then maybe that will empower individuals to, to follow as well. Yeah, I, I, I love that last comment you made about, um, you know, following up on the research, right? So like a lot of times we do research and then do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and at the same time, I'm thinking about like the people doing the research, right? Like maybe they didn't do anything about it because they're also like burnt out and knowing, totally. you know, they have so much work to do. And like, now we're going to have to implement this and that. And, and at the end of the day, um, you know, it's, it, it's about the organization making this a priority um, mm -hmm. and making sure that whoever's in charge of this, like, this is your priority. This is your responsibility. We're not going to ask you to do A, B, C, D, E, and F as well. And in, in addition to you know, like now handle uh, burnout, right? Um, so yeah, it, like it, it needs to be given, you know, some type of priority within organizations. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, it's it's also hard for organizations to, to make that decision. I mean, you know, you're, we live in a competitive world where, um, you know, organizations are competing with each other and like uh, telling an organization, oh yeah, you know, you gotta be a little bit more relaxed with your employees, um, you know, sometimes may not come across um, the right way. Um, uh, now, um, you know, Brittany, you, you were asking about, you know, what can individuals do, right? Because we can tell organizations to do a bunch of things and, you know, maybe some of them will do things and others won't. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it kind of also, um, you know, before I was saying, you know, like burnout is about you, the organization. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, we as individuals can do a lot, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, like I, I always think about PR practitioners and communicators, we're always, you know, kind of guiding our organizations when it comes to, you know, this, this is your mission statement, this is your vision statement, these are your values, you need to make sure that everything you do is aligned with that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we should do the same as individuals, right? Mm -hmm. um, we should define our own personal mission statement, right? It's, it's, it's really good to ask ourselves, um, you know, what, what's our purpose in life? Um, and understanding our purpose can really help us, uh, you know, just guide the decisions we make, um, you know, also, you know, create that personal vision statement. Where do you see yourself in five years? Um, you know, and, 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 and you, you need to spend time, uh, you know, defining what your values are. Um, you know, your, your personal values need to play a big role in influencing the decisions that you make in your own life. Um, you know, we will we'll be a lot happier with ourselves and our lives if the choices we make regarding how we spend our time are aligned with our own personal personal mission, right? And our own personal values. Um, and, you know, I also think it's, it's a really good idea to revisit your personal mission and your values once in a while, right? Just like companies completely reinvent themselves, you know, we, we can do that as well. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of concrete actions, um, you know, one of the first things that, you know, individuals, uh, you know, uh, what we should do to, you know, to take the time is to kind of, you know, just take the time to find the source of our burnout, right? Because um, a lot of times we're I'm burned out, but like, why are you burned out? Well, I don't know. And, and it's like, okay, well, think about that. Um, you know, uh, well, as soon as you realize, you know, the sources of your burnout, you can start to solve the problem. You can start to find ways, you know, to lighten your, 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 your load right away. Um, and, you know, I'd also say if, if you can tr try not to go through burnout alone, um, uh, mm. you know, just having, you know, some type of trusted friend, uh, loved one, uh, you know, help you through this process 
um, you know, can, can be so important, um, you know, and, and, and can, uh, you know, potentially help you brainstorm, you know, possible solutions to the problem. A lot of times, you know, when we're dealing with our own problems, we can't see things clearly. Um, on the other hand, you know, when we ask our friends, our loved ones, you know, they, they care for us, but they're also, um, you know, they're not attached to us. They see what we're going through and they see things differently and they can be a little bit kind of more objective um, regarding the decisions, you know, we should make. Obviously, at the end of the day, it's our own personal decision, but we should also kind of, you know, see what other people, um, you know, might think. Um, and, and, and I think just the last thing I'll say is I, I also feel that it's important um, to, 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 to not forget to be grateful. Um, you know, when we're dealing with a lot of stress, uh, we often forget that we have so much to be grateful about. Um, and, you know, and, and if you can, um, you know, tell others that you're grateful for them, right? For having them in your life. Just, I, I, I always feel that, you know, just spreading happiness, spreading joy, um, you know, it's just not, it's not only good for us, it's, it's, it's good for everyone. Um, and it also kind of just, you know, lifts some weight, the weight that we're carrying, and it just makes us, you know, feel better about everything. So just not forget to be grateful and to think, you know, every day, okay, what am I grateful about? What do I have that I'm happy for? Um, I think that sometimes, you know, could go a long way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That was so well said. Um, we definitely need to, um, would love to get to some questions from our audience. Um, there's some great questions lined up. Um, there is, Sarah, I don't know, I can take, do you want me to take this? Or yeah. Do you want to... yeah, do you want to read the ones in the Q&A first? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, we'll start with the ones that are in the Q&A um, box from John Morley. He asked, um, are employees who, are al who already show evidence of imposter syndrome doubly susceptible to burnout? What, what would you guys say about that? I don't have a specific answer to that. I, I, I don't know if from my own research, if I could speak specifically, but I think that sometimes when people are struggling with imposter syndrome, it leads to striving for perfectionism because they're trying to potentially overcompensate for what they think that they are lacking. And I think that that in fact can easily lend itself to um, experiencing burnout. And so I, there is probably potentially a connection there um, because when you're trying to to prove something to somebody because you don't believe it in yourself. Um, unfortunately, I think that that can be detrimental because you might end up working more or you know, overworking when it may not necessarily always be the case. Right, thank you. Um, here's a, we have a couple scenario-based questions. Um, one is an employee says that they need more resources to do their job better. And their manager says, well, you need to improve with what you have, and then we can talk about more resources for you. So then the employee is left facing increasing workload about the necessary resources. Um, and then they work hard to make improvements, and then they ask again for more resources, and their manager now says, well, you are, you are making work with what you have. Or, yes, sorry. <laughs> um, so no additional resources are needed. This catch-22 dynamic leads to worker burnout. How can this kind of scenario be handled better by managers and employees? Let me know if you want me to repeat anything about, you know, that question. Yeah, um, that's uh, such a such a good question. I mean, and, and, and it's a difficult one. Um, uh, I'd say, you know, if if you find yourself continuously asking uh, for more resources. Um, and you're never getting them, it's, it's probably time to start questioning whether you want to continue working in that organization. Um, uh, you know, it, it's important uh, to ask. It's important to see if, you know, um, uh, you know, the people around you are willing to help. Um, you know, if you see that they can't help, um, maybe this place isn't the right place for you. Um, but I'll also add, um, uh, it, it, we will not, you cannot find meaningful change within an organization if you're not seeing people at the top um, kind of really show that this is important, right? If, if maybe your supervisor is saying, no, I can't, you know, you're going to have to deal with that because that person's manager is telling them the same things and, and then the same situation goes on as you keep on going above and above. Um, and that's just kind of the, that company culture. 
Um, and you know, if we don't start at the top, if we don't make changes from the top, you'll never see those changes in, being implemented um, down the road uh, in an organization. So. You, you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, that it reminds me of, you know, one of the things I always kind of tell my students when they're always looking for that first job is like, please, please, please do the research before you accept that job, right? Like you feel waiting maybe two months, three months might be an eternity, but it really isn't. Um, it'll feel, you'll feel so much worse accepting a job that you got immediately um, than waiting for that right job three, four, five months down the road um uh that really fit who you were um and you know what you want to be as an individual at the end of the day it all comes down to what matters to you um uh and those are the decisions you need to make um you know you can ask the organization to make all the changes in the world um but some of them might uh, but you know you very you're very likely to find that a lot of them won't um so then it comes up to you what are you going to do about it right we ask organizations uh, you know, to be accountable. We should also ask ourselves to be accountable uh, mm -hmm. for the decisions we make. Um, mm -hmm. I feel that's you know, really, really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Christine asked, uh, Laura mentioned the importance of leader buy-in for programs, behavior and culture that combats burnout. At various points in my career, however, I've worked with leaders who seem committed to culture change along these lines, but lack the self-awareness to recognize how they're undermining their own efforts. For example, an advocate of flexible work and non-traditional schedules who frequently asks, where is everybody or where are you at the beginning of conference calls? Mm -hmm. so how do you recommend that communication professionals help hold that mirror up to affect behavior change among the leaders? How best to help leaders see that they may be unconsciously driving burnout culture? Yeah, I think this is a really tough um, question that I think that we see all too often. I don't know what the old adage is, but it says, you know, people leave, that people don't leave uh, bad companies, they leave bad bosses. Um, and so I think that this definitely is um, an, ex an example of that, but how can communication professionals um, hold up the mirror well, that means that uh, that person or whoever the professionals are, they're going to have to have, um, in some ways, the guts to go up to that person. And oftentimes in the organizational hierarchy might be even higher than them and, and call to attention that, hey, you know, we're seeing these, these repercussions or here is some employee feedback um, and do it in a way that potentially can then can cultivate some change. But I, I think it's, I sometimes have a hard question, have a hard time answering questions like this because I think we can't put too much on the communication professionals to cultivate the change. Um, because I think ultimately it has to be up to that leader to, to, to do so. Um, you know, in my, in my own, one of the committees I serve on in my own institution, they were, um, we're doing this work about agility and continuous improvement. And we have these agility teams across the university in each one of our different departments um, and in our different colleges. And they are asking us to coach our deans on how to put people first. Um, and I just, I'm not sure if that's really my job, uh, quite frankly. And so it's kind of putting me in sort of an uncomfortable position. And so I think um, there needs to be to make sure that whoever the communication professional is, that they already have a seat at the table so that they can feel comfortable having that conversation. Um, and always, you know, utilizing examples, I think is key as well. Um, but it is very difficult to, um, to have a leader who may not recognize the impact that they're having on their organizational culture or on their employees um, because they're unconsciously driving this. And I, from my own research, I can't tell you how many times I've sat with employees um, that commented about their um, managers, and then I go and speak with them about how they how their employees may be experiencing engagement or burnout. And unfortunately, um, there is a complete disconnect between the lived experience of employees and what management assumes is going on. And so, um, I do think the communication professionals can help that, but I do think that to be successful, there is going to need to be. Um, a seat at the table and, and some of that power discrepancy um, lessened so that that person would be open to hearing what they had to say. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree with um, what Laura has been saying. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not just entirely the, the communication practitioner's responsibility. I mean, it, 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 sure, they'll play a role, an important one, but um, it has to be an organizational uh, responsibility. And, um, it, 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 and you know, I, I, one of the things we can do is just kind of, you know, show what's going on, right? Maybe our role here is like telling that this, these are some case studies. This is what some of our other organizations are doing. This is what they've been doing correctly. And these are some others that have been doing things incorrectly, right? So like one of the things we're always talking about now is you know maybe we should have a four day week, right? Um, and some organizations are doing this effectively, and some organizations aren't, right? So maybe our job as PR practitioners, one of our roles is okay. Let's research what's going on. Let's go out and listen and, and see, talk to employees that have been dealing with this in some organizations. Some organizations have been extremely successful with four day work policies, and others have completely failed. Right. Um, the ones that fail, why are they failing? OK, they're failing because, yes, they're working Mondays through Thursdays, but, you know, Fridays, they're supposedly not working. But here we are, like having some meetings on Fridays anyways, because, you know, we have to do A, B and C. And if my boss is in that meeting, maybe I should be at that meeting there as well, because what does that say about me if I'm not there? So it's not my obligation. But, you know, so then we can learn. We can learn from what others are doing and see which are the ones that are doing things effectively and which ones aren't. And maybe we can take an approach that works. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I think we want to get in one more question. Um, we have a, a question from the chat. Many managers are tired of hearing about burnout and are already are, are ready for everyone to get back to normal. They're fine. Everyone else should be fine. Suggestions for how to handle this situation. What's normal? <laughs> I think this is a new normal. Um, I, just, I One comment I just have to make is that it, we have to understand, and I think Patrick touched on this, that everybody's experience is individual. And so we can't necessarily lump everybody together because there were a lot of people who worked throughout the pandemic that were more productive than they had ever been in their entire lives um, because they worked from home and they didn't have a commute and um, and it really benefited them and maybe they felt really successful and, and from some of the research that I did this was true for um, you know faculty and administrators and staff that work at higher ed institutions and um, I recently uh, had a paper under review and one of the reviewers said, well, I wasn't burnout. out. I was more productive than I've ever been in my, my entire career. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely not a one size all um, approach. And so unfortunately what that person has to understand is that, yeah, there should be some, in, there are potentially some employees that are not experiencing burnout, but there are a lot that are. And so I think that you have to recognize that a one size fits all approach is just not going to work. And then I think we also have to be honest that we are living in a new normal. We are never going to go back to, um, we can't go back into time, right? So we have shifted and changed um, culturally society has and so we are living in 2022 and so it's living and working in this year in this moment and in this time and figuring out ways um to to meet our employees where they are currently awesome thank you so much thank you both so much for speaking on this panel i know that this is such a important and topic that affects literally all of us um, today. And um, we're just going to be more grateful for, for your insight and for sharing that with us today. Um, and thanks for everyone for joining us. Um, we hope you enjoyed today's webinar. We will share this playback and resources on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, we have a and one announcement as well this week, we have a new episode of our series Race in the PR Classroom this Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern time on intersectionality, featuring, featuring Dr. Natalie Tindolf from the University of Texas at Austin and Dr. Jennifer Vardman from the University of Houston. So thanks again to our panelists and for everyone for attending today um, and stay tuned for the playback and for sharing these um, resources that we all discussed. Um, th thanks again. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.